All right, welcome, Saddleback Covenant Church. Thanks for watching and being here. Um, our uh, fearless leader, Pat Bray, went uh, under the knife. He got uh, knee surgery, so we're praying for him, and I think the word is he's doing really well, right? Okay, so we're here to worship your holy name, Jesus, and we consecrate this morning and this day to you, Lord God, in these songs. Let us, uh, even though we're not together in, uh, in the flesh, Lord God, let us be together in spirit, worshiping your holy name. Thank you, Lord.
lost my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet oh, Savior on that cursed tree his body Once again, it's really good uh, to come to you via satellite. I don't know how I'm getting through, but I am. Uh, deeply miss each one of you. Did have a chance to see a few of you yesterday at the going away drive through drop by sending out of the Morrisons who are moving to Fort Lauderdale. Wonderful couple. 
Uh, I know they felt loved and we are getting things done in the midst of COVID-19 and uh, we are going to enjoy this Memorial Day and remember in the midst those that have gone before us. I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer. Um, just so if you're watching on television, uh, if you on the screen, if you just bow your head and join with me. Lord, we, we thank you so much for those that have gone before us. We thank you for the Army, Navy, Marines, and Airmen, and Coast Guard. And Lord, those that have served in harm ways, harm's way for the benefit of others. And Lord, we would pray and hope that our efforts are always on the side of righteousness to do the right thing at the right time, to protect those that need protection, to um, fight evil appropriately, Lord, as civil magistrates. And I ask you, Lord, to be with the families who have lost loved ones, most recently, Lord, in these Gulf Wars and the Middle East and some before that um, in Vietnam, Lord, and even in Korea and World War II. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their heritage. And we thank you that we're free today that we are allowed to meet today and to share and uh, do what we want to do. Maybe we're not meeting as normal because of a virus, Lord, but we have the freedom to do and say what we want over these airwaves. And I thank you for that. I thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Memorial Day humbles me. It really does. When I think of some of the heroics that have gone on in our country to have a country back before the Declaration all the way through the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, um, the wars, the Indian Wars, the, the Spanish-American War, the War of World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, the Gulf Wars, the Middle East, a lot of war, not just in our nation, but around the world. We serve the Prince of Peace today, and, and yet we've been torn apart by wars for since the beginning of time. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want to read this scripture to you. Out of, first, uh, out of John 15, beginning in verse 12. This is my suggestion. Or, excuse me. This is my commandment. This is my commandment. I command you, Kevin, to do this. I am commanding you to love one another just as I have loved you. And beyond that, Kevin, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. There's no greater love that a person can do. For our military, it's not that all of them died, in, but all of them were willing to do that. It's a great act of love for people that will protect us and care for us. I'd like you to think about your own life as a memorial on this day. Would that be important to you? Would you like to be memorialized? Um, how many of you think of yourselves as humble? Could I see your hands? Bill, would you raise your hand? You think of yourself as humble, okay. Do we have any prima donnas, any divas, anybody uh, what do we have? Spurgeon said this, humility is to make a right estimate of oneself. The great theologian Ted Turner and founder of CNN said, if only I had a little humility, I'd be perfect. There are two kinds of egotists, those who admit it and the rest of us. Lawrence Peter Malcolm Ford said, too many people overvalue what they are not and undervalue what they are. 
many things in our culture talk about how special you are, like a little snowflake. No two snowflakes are the same, right? And you're very special. Well, you are special, but you're special for maybe a different reason. You're special because you're fearfully and wonderfully made by God, who knew you before the foundations of the earth and knows even before a word is spoken from your mouth, even before a thought comes forward, he weighs not only your actions, but your motives and holds them in the balance. Such knowledge is is too wonderful for us. But let's just say you're a one in a million person. One in a million. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. But the problem is, if you live in China, there's about 1,200 of you special ones out there because that's one person, uh, one out of every million. There's a thousand million. So over a thousand, just like you. But you are unique. And so am I. It's amazing. Uh, Sometimes I think about it. How do we even do this? Everybody's got two eyes and nose, two ears, and a chin and hair. And and yet there's facial recognition on everyone. I pick up the phone. I haven't talked to this person in 10 years. And I instantly remember their voice comes to me. How is that? What about the uniqueness of your laugh? Does anybody laugh exactly like you? Every once in a while, sisters... Uh, Dudley and her sister laugh exactly the same. I can't tell them apart. But it is unique how all of this comes together. But God calls us to walk humbly with him. And Winston Churchill, who I greatly admired, was a great thinker, but he was not known for his humility necessarily. I was going to try to do his accent, but that would I won't be able to do it. But he said... We are all worms, but I do believe that I am a glow worm. Sometimes we joke about our humility a little bit, um, and we kind of have a false humility about, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't care what anybody thinks. I introduced my son-in-law, Mike Spinella, one time that he was in the Mission Viejo High School Hall of Fame, the football team, uh, and... Um, he was there and he corrected me. He, was, he wasn't in it one year, he was in it two years. And, um, but he said it, was, he was laughing. He said, I, no, one, but two. Someone said, man, you played a great round of golf today. You had a couple birdies. I said, well, actually I had three birdies. You know, we have to plug that little extra into us even as we try to be humble. You had two birdies, oh yeah, thanks. I think it was three, I think, I think it was three. Um, but that's just the way our, our, we're, we're geared. We don't want to take credit, but we do want to take credit. God's put eternity in our hearts, and he's called us to walk humbly with him in the midst of this journey. In 1 Peter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, And all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God's opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I got a video recently that someone sent. It had two little chihuahuas, um, and one was on the couch and one was below the sofa, and they were going, (laughs) someone said, are you enjoying your special time during the, the virus? And I thought, I thought it was funny because um, it's just amazing how easily I, and I'm going to take a leap here, you may get your nose out of joint. What, get, what drives us to, to be humble? To me, it's to get back to where I came from. And what was that? I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I was lost. I was a veteran of the Vietnam War who came home and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I had $3,000 saved, which was, I mean, that was like a fortune 
So I wasn't working right away. I was doing job interviews, but I was starring in my own movie. And by the way, it wasn't that good a film. I don't think you'd want to see it. Uh, probably B, B movie at the best. But I thought I had, I thought I was in control. And somehow, in the midst of all of that, fake persona and macho and whatever else I was guilty of, God broke through in his inimitable way and grabbed me in his most kind and gracious way and said, you're mine. You're going to serve me your entire life. That wasn't even on my radar. Humility brings me back to who I really am and who we really are before God. And he tells us to clothe ourselves with it, with humility, which is a right estimation of ourself before God. We're to wear that clothing. I'd like to start a clothing line, someone out there. I'd like to call it humble wear. Um, it, it's authentic. It's not fake. It's made from God's grace and mercy. Humble wear. You can get it in, on Amazon. You'll have, to, you'll have to check it out. It comes with a lot of price, though. You get your headlights kicked out. You pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. You lose your life in order to find it. You consider all things as dung except for the knowledge of the excellency of Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's expensive clothing, but let me tell you, it, it, if you put it on and it's real, his grace pours into us. Clothe ourselves in humility. He gives grace to the humble, resists the proud. When I think of Memorial Day, I don't want to be all gloomy and doomy here. I want you to know those men who fought and died and women and the were as well, they did it willingly and went and fought and it was for you and I and our posterity to enjoy our lives. The Westminster Confession said, what is the chief end of man to, enjoy, uh, to worship God and enjoy him forever? Um, I have the privilege of having 10 grandchildren. Prior to COVID, whenever they came over, we always get a free show. These shows are worth so much money. I mean, these are terrific shows. I wish I could market them. But actually, the only ones that are going to really enjoy the show are the grandparents. Uh, because it's not like they've rehearsed or anything. They said, we've got a show for you. And then the kids go out and they start tumbling and we're laughing, the parents are laughing, and it's an absolute delight. I could pay hundreds of dollars and go to the Amundsen Theater and not enjoy myself like watching a three-year-old tumble in the backyard. It's the same way with God. To enjoy God, he enjoys seeing you tumble and enjoying this life that we're putting off the old, putting on the new, and walking humbly with our God, loving him and honoring him. He sees everything. There's nothing that escapes his eyes. Everything we've ever done, public, private, your worst sin, whatever you think that is, or your highest triumph, whatever you think that is, he doesn't run from you because he's shocked. He runs to you to heal. He's with you in all of it and through it in all of it. This is a relationship with him that goes beyond words. Memorial Day is about the men and women who served and died in the service of our country. Webster defines it as something to keep a remembrance alive. To keep alive a memory of someone or something I think one of the most difficult things is for those of you that have had to deal with friends or relatives struggling with Alzheimer's because they've lost their memory. Your memory is one of the most 
wonderful gifts God could give you. So often I'll be with a friend and we'll say, do you remember that time? And you go back and you relive it. And Memorial Day, for those veterans that have lived, um, oftentimes as they reflect with humility about those that have gone on, they recall and go back the memories that brought them through that season of their life. They did a study on memory and they said bad memories are like Velcro, they stick to you, and good memories are like waters off a duck's back. Meaning that when something good goes on in your life, you say, oh yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. It just, it just disappears. But when something bad has happened in childhood, early adulthood, or marriage, or whatever, it sticks. And we can't, it takes a tremendous amount of work to get our memories right. But we can do this through the blood of Christ. I want to to stress whatever bad memories you've got, God's in the process of healing as you turn to him and ask for his help. Memorials are touch points. Uh, Jesus was not opposed to them. Communion each Sunday is a memorial. Um, Water baptism is a type of memorial. Um, the woman that poured the ointment on Jesus' head before he was going to be crucified said this will be a memorial for future generations. I grew up surrounded by memorials when I was a young boy. I grew up in the Washington, D.C., Virginia area. In my earliest memories, memories we lived at Fort Myer, Virginia, my father was the post adjutant, and I would sit on the steps of the Robert E. Lee Mansion and look out over Washington, D.C., and every 4th of July, the fireworks by the Washington Monument. It was just a real thrill. I was only like, at the time, three or four, but I still remember that. And I remember looking over Memorial Bridge that led right to Abraham Lincoln's memorial, and over here was the Jefferson Memorial, and then as the years have gone on, we have the World War I, World War II memorials, the Spanish-American War, the Korean War, the FDR's memorial, Martin Luther King's memorial, the Vietnam memorial. And I've missed some. I've missed the Air Force memorial. There's so many, the Iwo Jima. I could go on and on. It's a city of memory. Those are touch points to remind us that freedom's not free and those who sacrificed before us. My favorite, I've said this almost every year when it comes to Memorial Day, is the tomb of the unknown soldier. We don't know his name. We don't know how he died or how, uh, where he died. Think of yourself as a young 21 World War II pilot who goes on a bombing mission and comes back to his carrier where his radar is knocked out and he has no way to communicate and he's looking over a vast ocean and an aircraft carrier looks like a dot. And he's coming back into headwinds and bad weather and he can't, he's looking and it's all visual. He can't figure it out. And he keeps going and going and... He never sees the carrier. And eventually, and now you're coasting and you hit the water, and now you're in the drink you're never heard from again. His mother, his father, his wife, his family, what happened to him? We never know. We don't know what happened. Maybe his plane was blown up. We don't know. There's no eyewitnesses. That tomb honors such a person. There are guards there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that they change the guard every half hour. A wreath is laid almost every day, and on the memorial weekend, there's usually, you'll see a clip on the news this weekend, although it's restricted because of COVID, um, where the president usually, or the vice president, will lay a, a wreath in honor of the unknown um, 
soldiers. It says, here uh, rests in honor and glory an American soldier known only to God. I want to say that most of us are also going to be relatively unknown. Who is the richest man in India? Ethan? He's worth $56 million. His name is Mukesh Abahan. Ethan, who's the most powerful man in Sudan? You don't know that one either. Man, you need to get, you need to get real here. We have Mohammed Hamdan Degala. He's a, war, a warlord. He's been charged with war crimes, but in Sudan, he's a really big deal. Who are the top, name the top four people in China. He just shrugged, folks. He doesn't know. President, the president you see on TV once in a while, but we don't know. I did a study of IQs. Who are the eight that had the highest IQs in the world? And I didn't know any of the top. The top guy had a 263 IQ. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. It's amazing. What fame and notoriety we want our lives to last. Uh, isn't it interesting that the most famous people want to get away from the notoriety? They'll wear disguises, they'll buy an island and the, you know, in the Bahamas or someplace where they can be alone because there's something built into the human mystique that we, we need to have our personal space. But once, But then on the other hand, we have this desire to count and make everything known. And we all have little kingdoms get carved out all around. But we really are going to be unknown. I think that everybody I'm talking to, I mean, some, maybe I'll be talking to someone here today that will be extraordinarily well known. But in a hundred years, we'll be unknown saints. If Jesus tarries another 500 years, it'll be as Dudley and I, when we went to, uh, we were in London, and I wanted to go to John Wesley's chapel, and we were walking along, and I saw a graveyard, and I, Paul Bunyan's grave, and I thought, Paul Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. So I went over, and it was a whole graveyard, and I started walking through it, and these were the outsiders. They were buried outside the city because they were not, they were nonconformists. They weren't uh, Anglican. But I started looking at the graves and I couldn't read the names because it had been worn away over the last 400 years. A big question is, what do you want on your tombstone? Good news, you only have about 500 years and then it'll be nothing but sandstone. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. There's so many anonymous men and women in the scriptures. Who was the good Samaritan? We don't know. I love people knowing my name, and I'm sure they love it when I know theirs, like in Cheers. Everybody knows your name, the old sitcom. But in the Bible, there's lots of people that are anonymous. Who's the centurion that had the sick servant? What's his name? I don't know. We don't know what happened to him either. Who was the rich, run, rich young ruler? What was his real name? Buddy Smith? We don't know. He's known as the rich young ruler. When we get to heaven, I might, assuming that the rich young ruler came around, I said, hi, I'm Kevin Davis. Oh, hi, I'm the rich young ruler. My real name is Phil Epstein. But, uh, you know, what, it, what I'm trying to say is they don't have... The Lord didn't even think it was important for their names to be listed. Gideon's 300, we don't know who those men were. They were so valiant. The men in the upper room, except for the apostles and Mary and a few others, a hundred of them, we don't know who they were. They were getting tongues of fire on their head, cloves, cloven tongues, and speaking in new tongues, and the power of the Holy Spirit had fallen on them. And we don't know who they were. There's so many that there's just no stories about their life. 
They don't have any recognition, and yet these people are incredibly important. Like the soldier in the tomb of the unknown soldier, you and I, whether we get notoriety or we're in obscurity, your life is incredibly important. Because what you do in your life affects far more than you and I even realize. What about the man born blind? What was his name? What about the sacred Phoenician woman that was begging for the Lord to heal her and said even uh, the dogs get crumbs from the table and Jesus said such faith I had not seen in all of Israel. What about the woman who was, had a hemorrhaging of blood for used all her money for 12 years on doctors and just touched Jesus and was healed? She had no name either. Or if she did, we don't know what it is. I'm sure she did, but we don't know what it is. It should be comforting to all of us that working in um, obscurity or plowing through your life day by day to understand that your life is a blessing to Almighty God as you surrender it to Him and love Him with your heart, with your soul, your mind, and your strength. The scriptures in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 9 say, as unknown, yet well-known, as dying, yet behold. I want to close today with speaking of one particular soldier who was amazing. Um, it's in Acts 10, chapter 4. He was from, his name was Cornelius, and he's from Caesarea, about 30 miles from Jerusalem, towards the water. He was, a, um, he was a centurion of what is called an Italian cohort and had authority over 100 men. He was not a Christian. He, was not, he had no home group. He had no New Testament because he had no Bible. He was a devout man. He feared God, it says in other part of the scripture. And there are, uh, there are people out there who aren't Christians yet are devout and fear God. They haven't had anybody show them who God really is. Not only did he fear God, but his whole, house, whole household, he gave many alms. Alms were uh, his money in service to the Jewish people. That's wild to me that an uncircumcised Roman would be giving alms to a Jewish community who generally were a bone of contention with the Romans. I'll read, uh, I'll read this uh, in Acts, if you bear with me here, uh, beginning in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a man um, at Caesarea named Cornelius, a, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he was clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Wow. The first Gentile convert, all you Irish people out there like myself, part, we never would have gotten saved without Cornelius. All of Europe. Later, he is baptized in the Holy Spirit and Peter realizes that the gospel is not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Wouldn't it be awesome if our lives were really a memorial before God and ascended to heaven in such a way that we had the Lord's attention? Cornelius walked in the light he had, devout, and he feared God and his household. To impart something, you have to have it. Years ago, a friend of mine came to me for counsel because he's having trouble with his son who was very selfish and 
stingy. It was, you know, he, should, he should have been of an age where he was sharing more. And he was concerned about it. And I just said to him, I said, well, do you consider yourself a generous man? And he said, mm, not really. And so my next question, you get it, you guessed it. I said, well, why do you want to have a generous son? You can't impart something unless you have it. You can't impart love unless you have love. You can't impart joy unless you have joy. This leads us to the fact that it's our responsibility to allow God to work in us and form us. We're being transformed by the renewing of our minds into the image of Christ. There's so much I could say this morning about memory and memorializing. They come from the same root word and all of that. But I'm going to give way here to, uh, we have th three um, veterans that were asked to share this morning. Um, we're going to hear from Paul Pettit, who was an F-18 pilot um, in the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah! And then we have, um, that was a bad hoorah, I know, Paul. And then we're going to hear from um, Bo Beardsley, dear friend, I've known him his whole life, who uh, joined after 9-11 with his brother, and, and then uh, he was in combat in Ramadi in uh, the Middle East, and Bo continues to uh, be a blessing to veterans and those around him. Um, Bo really understands the honor of having the privilege to serve. And finally, C.M. Merriman, who went to my father's alma mater, which is West Point, New York. C.M. graduated, was a combat engineer, and now he's a business executive. He's been out for a while, but when you go to the point, it leaves an impression, and the military, uh, you can't get away from that. And so, for, so I just asked him to take a couple minutes to share with you. I hope it's a blessing, and I, I, I hope at this time that all that's going on with uh, the virus, I can feel the movement as well as you. There's movement around us, light at the end of the tunnel. Let's not lunge at the tape. Let's be gracious people moving in concert in un unanimity. And um, let's prefer those around us that may are more stringent with guidelines and less stringent, whatever it is that we walk this thing out in unison and harmony, and we have a great Memorial Day weekend. God bless you. I know I'll see you soon. And um, let's hear, uh, oh, one last, Tony, thank you. To Pat Bray had surgery on his knee, so Tony will be, has been leading worship this morning, and thank you, Tony, for stepping up. God bless. Good morning, Saddleback Covenant family. This is Paul Pettit coming to you from the Pettit household. Pastor Kevin asked me to speak and reflect on my military service as we celebrate Memorial Day weekend this weekend. As many of you know, I was a United States Marine for 10 years from 1989 to 1999, and I served as a F-18 pilot in the Marine Corps. One of the tools that we used in the F-18 was a tool called the flip chart. And on our knee board, we would have this chart that would basically show us what the terrain was coming in front of us, how to avoid AAA and surface air missile systems on our way to delivering bombs to a target. This particular training mission was uh, just west of Lake Havasu, and it took us all the way down the Southern California desert until we crossed the Salton Sea, and then we dropped our ordnance in a restricted area just north of El Centro called the R2510. And, uh, that was a training mission that we would fly regularly. Well, equally as important as seeing what's coming out in front of you is reflecting on what's behind you as well. And that's what we do this weekend on Memorial Day. And uh, in this Memorial Day weekend, I'd like to pay particular honor to one of my personal heroes, a Navy SEAL whose name was Michael P. Murphy. And uh, his role in the U.S. Navy was uh, immortalized not only by his actions serving in Afghanistan, but by the movie Lone Survivor. 
in which he gave his life uh, serving his SEAL team. And I'd like to read his citation as we celebrate Memorial Day this weekend. For service as set forth in the following, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty as the leader of a special reconnaissance element with Naval Special Warfare Task Unit Afghanistan on 27 and 28 June 2005. While leading a mission to locate a high-level anti-coalition militia leader, Lieutenant Murphy demonstrated extraordinary heroism in the face of grave danger in the vicinity of Azadabad, Konar Province, Afghanistan. On 28 June 2005, operating in an extremely rugged enemy-controlled area, Lieutenant Murphy's team was discovered by anti-coalition militia sympathizers who revealed their position to Taliban fighters. As a result, between 30 and 40 enemy fighters besieged his four-member te four team. Demonstrating exceptional resolve, Lieutenant Murphy valiantly led his men in engaging the large enemy force. The ensuing fierce firefight resulted in numerous enemy casualties as well as the wounding of all four members of his team. Ignoring his own wounds and demonstrating exceptional composure, Lieutenant Murphy continued to lead and encourage his men. When the primary communicator fell mortally wounded, Lieutenant Murphy repeatedly attempted to call for assistance for his beleaguered teammates. Realizing the impossibility of communicating in the extreme terrain and in the face of almost certain death, he fought his way into open terrain to gain a better position to transmit a call. This deliberate, heroic act deprived him of cover, exposing him to direct enemy fire. Finally, achieving contact with his headquarters, Lieutenant Murphy maintained his exposed position while he provided his location and requested immediate support for his team. In his final act of bravery, he continued to engage the enemy until he was mortally wounded, gallantly giving his life for his country and for the cause of freedom. By his selfless leadership, courageous actions, and extraordinary devotion to duty, Lieutenant Murphy reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Signed, George W. Bush. So we honor uh, Michael P. Murphy this weekend, and we honor over a million others who gave their life in service of our country and proving that, in fact, freedom is not free. Hi, I'm Sia Merriman, and I just wanted to wish all of you a fantastic Memorial Day weekend for myself, as well as my family, my beautiful wife, Jama, and my fantastic kids, Charlie and Maya. And we certainly miss seeing all of you. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about what my time in the military has meant to me and mostly ask for you to remember our fallen soldiers and their families in your prayers this weekend as we celebrate our national holiday. I had the privilege of serving the Corps of Engineers in the U.S. Army, and I spent about five years in it. I left the service as a captain, and during my time, I served in a combined arms task force in the 1st Cavalry Division, uh, taking me to some great garden spots around the world like Panama and the Middle East, and I also spent some time in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea, up near the DMZ. Again, another garden spot in the world. But uh, listen, in all that, just some amazing experiences and really some amazing people that I'm very thankful to have served with. I look back on those days now with a lot of pride, a lot of great honor, and how much it really meant uh, for me to serve alongside some of what I consider to be the best, most dedicated, um, and most selfless men and women in our country. And I think that word selfless is really the one that comes back to me each time I uh, think back about uh, my time. And so luckily though, I would tell you that I can call many of them my friends. And for that, I am forever thankful, especially through some very trying and very forming, uh, formative years in my life. Uh, I've always been a little bit conflicted, to be honest with you, with this holiday. Um, it is one that um, I think about a lot at this time. It's one that, in one sense, I'm saddened by the fact that it's a day to remember, you know, in memorial. Uh, on the other hand, though, it's a day that we can honor those that have really given their ultimate sacrifice. And I feel that there's no greater sacrifice, you know, to give than to give one's life for another. And, and I hope you can identify with that thought, certainly. Uh, I think often of my friends, my classmates that have passed in service to our country. Um, I think about their families. And I would just ask you at this time to please uh, join me in praying for them, their families, and remembering, uh, remembering them in our thoughts and prayers today especially, uh, that they may feel peace and they may feel comfort um, at this time. And so that is the best thing that I feel we can do for them, and I really appreciate your help in that. I do know this, you know, as I look forward, it takes a family, it takes a community of support really to do 
what our service men and women do each day uh, and that we sometimes take for granted. You know, Jama, as I was going through this, was amazingly supportive uh, during our time in the military. Uh, there were a lot of letters and actually a really a lot of letters, not emails, not texts, not this, uh, but written letters and they meant the world. And I think even sneaking in here and there, we got a satellite phone call way before smartphones were even uh, a thing um, when we were when I was in the desert. So we were very thankful for that. And I think if you could just happen, you know, if you know anyone in the service and you happen to get a chance just to drop them a text, please reach, reach out to them or their family, the spouse, um, or any other family members to just thank them for what they do. That would be greatly appreciated. And I, I will tell you, it goes a long way, especially when those people are out there standing on the front line day and night, oftentimes at great distances and separated for long periods of time. It really would mean the world. So uh, please do that. Um, you know, I'd ask you to just take a, a minute to consider all that we're blessed to do. Lift up our servicemen and women um, in prayer. And I can't wait to see you all again, other than on Zoom, no offense, um, for now. I would ask you to give each other a virtual hug as I'm giving to you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Please take care and have a safe holiday. Good morning, everyone. This is Bo Beardsley. Happy Memorial Day weekend and happy quarantining. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit about my time in the military and uh, what Memorial Day means to me. Um, so I was in the United States Army, uh, and I deployed to Iraq from 2006 to 2007. Uh, my job was to be an infantryman. And my first half of my deployment was in Talifar, which is up north of Iraq by the Iranian and Syrian border. And we were living in a, an abandoned Iraqi business building. Uh, we shared the complex with Iraqi army, Iraqi policemen, and the Kurdish military. Uh, from that compound, we did a lot of raids. We did a lot of uh, just standard patrols, uh, battalion, brigade, cordon search missions. And at times we actually got ambushed as well by grenades, mortar rounds, of course, and uh, pop shots from sniper fire. Um, we were there for a good while and right away the enemy made themselves known pretty quick, but we responded and made ourselves known pretty fast as well. And um, while we were there, uh, a place called Ramadi in the Anbar province of Iraq was beginning to get worse and worse. And we had heard about how bad that place was. And then eventually we got the call that we were going to be the, um, the main unit going down there to drive out the terrorists of that city. So we got down there and the invasion started uh, first week of June. And I remember the first night of the invasion, I was sitting in the back of a Bradley tank and looking around and seeing every single branch of the military right before me. The Air Force was involved. The U.S. Navy was involved, and of course the Marine Corps. And I remember seeing first the Air Force went in and dropped their bombs, and then they did the suppressive fire by air. And then the uh, Marine Corps and us went in and invaded the city uh, door by door. And of course the Navy SEALs went up on the rooftops and did sniper overwatch for us. And that's kind of how it was day in, day out. We did multiple missions a day, mostly at night though because the sniper fire in Ramadi was so heavy. Uh, at the time, it was the number one most dangerous city in Iraq because it was protected by the Euphrates River, uh, in a sense. And by that, they were able to go to Ramadi, refit with their weapons and supplies, and then go back out to the other cities in Iraq and um, battle the coalition forces. So we were actually, our job was to just flush all them out. Um, whatever force necessary. And it was a long, long, hard fight. Um, it took a lot of lives in Ramadi. A lot of people sacrificed not only their lives, but their body and of course their minds. And um, being in Ramadi though was really neat. It allowed me to see the United States military as a whole all at once before me. Um, so it's funny, there is a rivalry between branches in the military uh, even in the chow hall, you kind of sense the division a little bit. But when you're out there in the field in combat with Americans, and we're all wearing that same sh uh, flag on our shoulder, that meant something. And we were all working as one unit together for the same goal, for the same mission. And that's what's neat about Memorial Day. It's, it's not about the branch, it's about the servicemen and women uh, who gave the ultimate sacrifice. I've always taken this uh, holiday a little bit further though, and I just, 
I've always seen it as a good excuse to celebrate those who've served in any way possible. Um, whether it's time of combat or not, everybody did their part. And, you know, one thing I had with me when I was over there was my own American flag. And my own American flag, I bought this flag in actually Ramadi. I, uh, before Ramadi, before Talifar, I bought this flag in Kuwait. We stayed in Kuwait for about two months to train, and then we deployed to Talifar. So in Kuwait, I bought this flag knowing that I wanted to keep this with me throughout my deployment. Um, so this flag went on a lot of missions with me. When I had a rucksack with me on these missions, this was in my rucksack. And then when we got down to Ramadi, I decided to go ahead and just put this in the Iraqi home we were living in. And um, this is a picture of my platoon when we were over there in Ramadi. Uh, this is an Iraqi house we took over, and that's the flag uh, that I bought. So it's it's pretty neat um, token I have from that time of my life. And of course, this is uh, my grandfather's flag. He was in World War II. He was an infantryman as well, and he was in the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, Staff Sergeant Charles Beardsley, and uh, he was in the, the French Theater. He was in the Italian Theater, and of course, the German Theater as well. He had a Purple Heart and the Bronze Star was awarded to him as well with Valor. And so he used to raise this flag every uh, morning and, and raise it down every night. And uh, when I was in Ramadi, he actually passed away. So I was able to have the honor to take his flag and um, keep it for my own sake, from one infantryman to the other. Um, but yeah, th this holiday is very significant to me. I know it is to my twin brother, Will, who served uh distinguishedly in Fallujah and in Baghdad as a cavalry scout and um I know it's not just celebrating the servicemen and women who served but also the family members I've been on the other side as a family member seeing my brother go to war and I know how that feels when your loved one is over there in harm's way and you can't do anything about it and so I've been on the other receiving side of that so I do believe I have an understanding of both sides of how it feels um, and that's why this holiday means a lot to me, um, uh, for many reasons, of course, but, um, thank God for you guys and your support during that time for me and my brother. And, uh, if you guys happen to see a service member in passing, just make sure you tell them thank you. Cause that goes a long ways. Love you guys. Happy Memorial Day weekend and take care. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he's my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he's my song. You are good. You're never gonna let 
You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Be blessed.